1970s Manchester was a city stuck between worlds. A city trying to rediscover itself from the clutches of its Victorian past. The coughed and spat on cobbles that once bared the weight of our ancestors are now being changed, tarmacked, covered over. Manchester is being born again. The regeneration. Music, football, fashion and culture. Times were changing. The archways that once housed horse and cart were now back street garages and cut and shut shops. Prostitutes in dingy doorways and a blind eye being turned down the dimly lit back streets where the criminal underworld could fulfill the dirty needs. 200, 300, 400, 500. Nice one, the money's there. Next time, if you want more than his legs breaking, he gives a shout. No cameras. No evidence. Sounds like the perfect place to commit a crime and get away with it. Crimes such as murder. Murder it still remains a mystery. Almost 50 years on. On the 25th of January, 2010, the human remains of an unidentified woman was shockingly discovered by construction workers working on a site of a former car park in the Angel Meadow area of Manchester. The car park ran between Angel Street Danzig Street and Miller Street. The site was being prepared for the redevelopment for the new headquarters of the co-op. The body was rolled up in the interior of a blue Ford Cortina carpet. The flesh and muscle tissue had completely rotten away, leaving nothing but skeletal bones and clothing. The construction workers quickly rang for the police to report the findings. And as the police arrived, they presumed it was skeletal remains of a body dating back to the Victorian era, due to Angel Meadow being a notorious Victorian slum, where 40,000 poor souls lie buried underneath the park. But they soon realised this was no ordinary body and the fabric it was rolled up in was too new and modern and the clothing didn't match the era it was originally presumed from. This is when the penny dropped and further examination was conducted. It was revealed in the autopsy that the woman had in fact been murdered and in a brutal in vicious way. The victim had suffered a fractured neck, broken collarbone and jaw. Due to the poor state of the body, it was hard to identify the woman's age, race and height, and even the date of death. But the police believed her to have been murdered anywhere around the 1970s to the 1980s and it was estimated that she was aged around 35 years old. She would have been a modern day size 12 and her height was between five foot one, five foot seven inches tall. She could have been European or possibly Middle Eastern. She had a number of fillings and her first upper right premolar was missing. 
which would have been very apparent when she smiled. She was found wearing a blue jumper, blue bra, and a green pinafore dress, black stiletto shoes, which only one was found. The pinafore dress was very distinctive, and it had large buttons and a unique 1970s style pattern. A number of items were found near the body, including a plastic Guinness measuring chart from the 1960s, an orange patterned carpet, dark blue carpet, handbag and tights, but the contents of her handbag was missing. One of the carpet pieces which covered the body was from a car as the feature hole cut for the gear stick fitted that perfectly the four Cortina the guard a killer must have had access to with no name no identity no DNA matching any of the police records the case went cold she was given a state funeral and her remains were buried in Southern Cemetery attended sadly by only two people. The two people being the detectives that was assigned to the case. This was someone's daughter. Possibly someone's mum. An auntie. A family member. And to this day, no justice has ever been served. On the headstone, she was given the name that only seemed fitting to such a poor soul. And she was named the Angel of the Meadow. So I'm back out today, and I'm on familiar territory. Um, I'm in Angel Meadow, and as you know, I've documented this place many times. Um, it's featured in some of the stuff that I've done, and it's been heavily documented by other YouTubers, and brilliantly too. Um, but this story in particular is a very, very, very sad one. It's a tragic one, and it's still unsolved to this day. Now. The reason that it, this, it caught my attention, the whole story gripped me and caught my attention because of the connection to Angel Meadow. Um, and I found it shocking that, you know, years on, hundreds of years on, that there's still, this place is still churning out sort of stories um, of tragedy and death. And wholeheartedly, hand on heart, the reason for this video is to document um, and to try and bring some sort of justice to this poor woman that was found. Um, now you will have seen a bit of history at the beginning of this video. And I'm not going to delve too much into it because I don't want to sort of repeat what I've just sort of said really. But this poor woman, like I say, there was ne never any justice for her. She was never identified, the killer was never identified. And if it wasn't for that glass building behind me that you can see above the trees, that's the um, co-op building. Now they were constructing that building um, and when they were building the foundations, they discovered the poor body of this woman that was wrapped in a Ford Cortina interior carpet, just dumped. Now, what I want to do in this video is I want to sort of the best I can and I will try the best I can because the whole area is being changed so it's hard to pinpoint where she would have actually been. But I think I've got a pretty good idea of where she would have been discovered. Um, but I've just been going around the area and it's quite eerie knowing that someone that holds this dark and sinister secret of killing someone is actually in the same spot that I were, you know, sort of 30, 40 years on. Um, it's chilling. 
and when I've looked at the rooftops other, other than these big glass buildings now but the, the old buildings that sort of look down on it if someone was looking at, at that at that exact time they would have spotted him you know or whoever it were that killed him now there will be suspects in this video and what I will do is I'll do my best to sort of highlight these suspects that were brought to the attention when this body was discovered um, so what I'm going to do now is we're going to head over to the actual location of where this poor woman was discovered <coughs> The first suspect is none other than Peter Sutcliffe, or better known as the Yorkshire Ripper. Peter Sutcliffe was found guilty in 1981. Very much. Very much. Get in, get in. <laughs> of murdering 13 women and attempting to murder seven others between 1975 and 1980. He was sentenced to 20 concurrent sentences of life imprisonment. Two of Sutcliffe's murders took place in Manchester. All the others occurred in West Yorkshire. It's clear to see why Sutcliffe's name would raise a few eyebrows. After all, the time frame fits, and so too the area. It was on a killing spree around the same time as our victim was suspected. He also wanted the bodies of his victims to be found, almost like playing cat and mouse with the police, and to be wrapped in a carpet of a shallow grave in the heart of Manchester. Sounds like something he would have done. It just so happens that this one, it gone unnoticed. You can't argue that there aren't similarities, but there's a few inconsistencies. The style of death doesn't really fit his sick and twisted criteria. Peter Tobin is a convicted Scottish serial killer and sex offender who's currently serving life sentence at HM Prison Edinburgh. He committed three murders between 1991 and 2006. As well as the three murders, police firmly believe that Tobin claimed more victims. He's reported to have been boasted in prison of having killed up to 48 people. Tobin has been labelled a psychopath by a senior psychologist and by a criminology professor. Next up, we have Ronald Castro. Ronald Castro was a comic book dealer and taxi driver from Shaw in Oldham. He was jailed in 2007 for life for the abduction and murder of Leslie Molseed. Initially, a man named Stefan Kisko was arrested and charged with the murder of the young girl. Kisko being an intellectually disabled young man who lived near Mulseed on the Turf Hill estate. He was wrongly convicted of sexually assaulting and murdering her, but still served 16 years in prison before his conviction was overturned. Kisko's mental and physical condition deteriorated rapidly whilst he was in prison and he died 20 months after his release in 1992 before he could collect the money owed to him for his suffering. His ordeal was described by one British MP as the worst miscarriage of justice of all time. However, in 2006, a DNA match led to the arrest of Ronald Castro for the Molsey murder. He was convicted the following year and sentenced to life in prison. But DNA tests show that both Tobin and Castro are not linked to the murder and after extensive DNA, it was ruled out 
of the inquest. But there's one wicked and vicious man that seems to have somehow slipped the net and gone under the radar. He killed strikingly in the same manner as our poor lady was found in Angel Meadow. He was a convicted serial killer. He fits the time frame and he lived very close to the area. He was also connected with the murder of a woman named Dorothy Layden, whose body was also dumped a few hundred yards from where the Angel of the Meadow was found. But he was never convicted. And his name was Trevor Hardy, better known as the Beast of Manchester. He was convicted of killing three girls and accused of many more. They all died in a violent and vicious manner, with brute force, strangled, broken bones. You name it, Hardy was one nasty piece of work. Two of the victims were dumped in Manchester, a familiar stomping ground for the beast. One body partially wrapped on a building site. The other in a shallow grave. The contents of the handbags missing, just like the angel. Stabbed, strangled, or by any means of violence. Hardy seems the ideal fit. I could be completely wrong, but I cannot fathom as to why he was never suspected of this murder. Given the time frame, the style of kill, and the area, he seemed like the likely candidate. How many more killers must there have been at that time in Manchester? So here we are now, and this is sort of the approximate location where the car parks were. Now, as you can see all around here, it is just a sort of glass construction. Um, the new futuristic buildings that are going to be going up in Manchester that sort of dwarf the old ones. Um, they're much, much bigger. And like I say, they're all glass. But on this corner here, if you was to turn all the way around here, um, there was an entrance point here that went down the street. Now, we believe the woman was um, approximately in front of where this, this sort of these um, cabins are. And like I say, this whole area is changing now. This was just once a, like a, a mass car park here. And I think it was old factories originally. And when they've knocked the factories down, they've left the footings in and, and used them as car parks. And when I came here a couple of months back, I thought, brilliant, I'll go over here and I'll film. But like I say, it's all taken up now with the new, the new buildings that are going up. So, I reckon I've sort of worked out the exact spot of where this poor woman's body was discovered. Um, I came past it before and it felt really strange. It was like, sort of giving me a little knock in my stomach. Um, now I've tried to work this out at the best that I can because it's really hard to sort of figure out the layout I'm sorry about the, the noise um, we'll figure out the layout of this place and I'm trying my best to go back and have a look at it now I do think that where the, the body was discovered is exactly where there is like a bit of a restricted paper and it almost looks like a bit of a crime scene some strange reason 
when I've angled it up on the, the photograph, it looks like the exact spot. And it's weird and it's eerie because it's like an indicator to say, yeah, it was here. And there's still some sort of like, like crime scene tape. Um, and I think it was in this exact spot. Now, like I say, the person that committed this crime all those years ago would have been exactly in the exact spot that I am right now. Um, it makes me feel a bit sick thinking about it. And it makes me even more sick that you know this woman was never given any justice. It, it's so, so sad. But like I say, the killer would have been around this area in the same spot as, as me right now. And you know, his intentions were evil, were sinister. And that vibe is reverberating around this little section. To be stood in a place where he would have you know, he had the audacity to just wrap in a sheet and dump, just as if no one would ever discover it. And as crazy as it sounds, it never were for decades until the redevelopment of uh, the co-op building. So for him to have the audacity, like I say, to actually come here, the sinisterness of it, probably skulking around at night time, found a spot and thought right yeah let's put her there and then put her in the spot and then left you know and for him to never have been caught really really makes my blood boil because he's got away with murder and like I said it could just be the, the your average Joe it could just be the old guy that's quiet at the end of the street it could be the guy that you walk past down the street you go shopping and You've worked with him for years. It could be him holding this burden, this sinister dark burden, this dirty little secret that he had. You know, he's kept it to himself for all them years. And he got away with it. And this poor woman was never even given any justice. And there was one guy that came forward, which I will have already put in this video. And he reckons it. He recognised her, he said she looked nothing like the e-fit, but her clothes matched everything, the description. You know, there's no other leads to it. Um, but like I say, this place now is unrecognisable. It's not the car park that it once were. It's now this sort of glass, cosmopolitan, bustling city. Um, and like I said in the video, on a, uh, sorry, like I said before, these buildings here, these are the old buildings. If someone was looking out one of them windows, they would have caught him in the act, they would have seen what he was doing. These would have witnessed that night what went on. You know, though if they always, it's that, that old saying in it, if walls could talk. And if walls could talk, they'd know who this person were. And they'd, you know, they'd know this poor woman. Um, so like I say the aim of this video is not to just sort of jog some memories or maybe spark some sort of further investigation someone else could pick this video up and carry it on and delve into it a lot more than I will um, but the ultimate goal is to find you know some justice for this woman and you know I'd love for one day we'd be able to identify who she were and a killer you know justice needs to be done both ways for him and for her. The only witness to ever come forward was a statement given by a man named Alec Whittle, whose encounter with the suspected angel of the meadow has haunted him for decades. He said he distinctly remembers speaking to a barmaid. He said it was early 1970s and I was about 22 at the time. I'd just left the army. He arrived for a cold beer at a pub on Stanley Grove in Longsight. He started chatting to the barmaid. He took a shine to her, but remembers being shocked when she unbuttoned the collar on her t-shirt and showing him the bruises on her neck and shoulders. She mentioned to him that she had no relatives and he said that he wanted to help her. Then a bloke came in 
and she told me to shush and sit down. No, 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 shh, shh, sit down, sit down, sit down. But the conclusive piece of evidence that has been etched in Alex's mind is that of the pinafore dress. He remembers it being hung up behind the bar that was found on the body decades later. He said, I remember that dress. It was a distinctive pattern. A great Gatsby style pattern. I remember it well. I used to doodle it. Alec is convinced that the woman that he spoke to that night, who remembers being afraid, was the woman whose body was discovered at Angel Meadow years later. After researching the case, seeing firsthand where this woman was discovered, her soul snatched from her body by the claws of a killer and tossed into a shallow grave, yards from where I was stood, done by a sick, twisted individual whose rage was clearly uncontrollable. The sick feeling in my stomach was knowing that the ground on which I was walking upon was also the steps the killer took. The land scarred with emotion. The emotions of immense sadness, helplessness, anger, and sorrow. I needed to pay my respects. beautiful southern cemetery um, it's absolutely stunning as far as graveyard goes anyway um, I'm not no graveyard expert but yeah it's pretty special second biggest in Europe it's absolutely huge so you can imagine how hard it must be trying to find a grave you know the angel of the meadow um, it's like a needle in an haystack but thanks to my dad for doing a bit of research I reckon we found the, 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 um, the spot so we're gonna head over there in a second but basically I wanted to come full circle with this video. Now I wanted to get as close as I possibly could to the, the site where she was buried, um, where they found her body. Um, and I do know it's a dark, dark video, um, but there's no way I could have revived the story and told her story and, you know, sugarcoated it in a way. There's, it's a brutal and savage murder. Um, so the aim of the video is to make people aware of this poor woman. Maybe it'll jog a few memories, maybe it'll just spark that interest that someone goes, I remember something about that, you know. But like I say, ultimately it's to, it's in the memory of her and telling her story. You know, this was her story, this was what happened to her and she was never even identified. And today, she, she's at rest in um, Southern Cemetery. But like I say, I wanted to revive the story the best that I could, but also do her uh, some justice if I possibly could. Because um, I've just got nothing but the absolute mass, mass sympathy for what, you know. The whole story's so sad. From not being named to not identifying the killer to, you know, her being just lay there. I've walked past that place before 2010 and never knew for one second there was a this poor woman was underneath my feet and many other people you know I've, I've walked past her for years and years 
But like I say, if anything good comes from this video, then it was a job well done. So basically what we're gonna do now is we're gonna head over and pay our respects to the angel of the meadow. So here we are everyone. And we're actually at the resting place and the grave for the angel of the meadow. And I just wish we knew who you were. I wish we knew the answers to the questions. And I don't like calling you the angel of the meadow because I know that you had a name. But I suppose you are an angel in your own rights, aren't you? I just wanted to basically make, tell your story so people are aware of what happened and who you are. And hopefully one day we'll find out, just, you know, we'll find out who you are. We'll find out who did this horrible crime to you. Um, I just wanted to bring you these. These are some flowers. And they're not just off me, but they're on behalf of everyone who's watched this video. And I want you to know that you're not forgotten. And I want you to know that you are loved and you are missed because you belong to someone, somewhere. And I can only, my heart goes out to you and your family. So like I say, they're just a little gesture from me and the viewers. And I hope people come and visit you more often now because what happened that, that day well, um, it shocked, it shocked Manchester and I hope you're at rest.